It is my honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker. He's a man of many great things, a man of God, a man most humble, a man who always wears black instead of orange. He's the chaplain here. He helped our last speaker, Pedro, change his life. Please, everybody, give it up for Deacon Lape. I started my career as a, as a social worker, and for 23 years, I worked in the substance use disorder fields and behavioral health. 18 of those years, I ran outpatient clinic and partial hospitalization programs, along with some residential programs. It brought a real sense of purpose and fulfillment in my life, something that's really important to me. Along the way, I got this idea that maybe I'll become a deacon in the Catholic Church. I prayed about it, talked with people about it, applied, and six years later, they actually ordained me a deacon in May of 2011. Then a few years later, I got a phone call from the diocese, and they said to me, we have a position open at a prison and we think you would be a really good at being a prison chaplain. I wasn't sure how to take that comment. I thought about it, I prayed about it, talked with people about it, and then here I am. I thought at that time, I'm sure there's lots of Catholics in the prison that I can give spiritual guidance and nurturance to. Why not? I could do something different. I got here, and on the first day, they gave me a list, and they said, here's the list of all the faith groups that are in this facility. And you are responsible for the Catholics, Santerias, Rastafarians, Wiccans, and Buddhists. I said, okay. And along with that, in this facility, we also have very active members of the Nation of God and Earth, Nation of Islam, Muslim, Shia, Odinists, Jewish, Native American, and Protestant. I walked away saying, I have a lot to learn. Not only do I need to learn about the prison environment and how to be a chaplain in the prison environment, but also all of these faith groups. But I realized quickly that I had something that not a lot of people had. I worked directly with an imam, a rabbi, and an Episcopalian priest. And no, that's not the start of a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> I also got a lot of support from the staff here who do the religions and the incarcerated individuals themselves. I remembered quickly of something I read of Mother Teresa, who worked with the dying and the poor of Calcutta. And there was a young journalist who wanted to interview her. And she said to Mother, isn't this great? You have a chance to spread the gospel and to talk about Jesus with all these people and possibly convert them before they die. And Mother Teresa, who was all about four foot 11, looked up at the reporter, shook her finger in her face, and said, no, no, no. I'm here to help them be the best Hindi, the best Muslim, the best person that they can be. That's kind of my mantra now as a prison chaplain. I'm here to work with all people of all faiths to be the best person that they can be. Whether it's helping a group get the resources they need so that they can run a service, a class, or a festival, or providing pastoral care or spiritual direction to a person in need, or need to be the bearer of bad news and meet with someone and let them know that a loved one had just died. I needed to make sure that I was 
present to that person, listening to those people, and providing hope at a time in their lives when they struggle the most. Joining in with them in their shared humanity, joining in with them in their pain and their joy. This was even more evident a few years ago during the COVID peak, if you will. We're still dealing with it, obviously. And the programs were all shut down for periods of time. So, and all the non-essential employees were asked not to come in so that we can keep everyone as safe as we could. And we chaplains, our roles changed dramatically. My job became walking the cell blocks and housing units, stopping and talking with everybody who I encountered, listening to their pain, their confusion, their new normal, if you will, their fear, hearing them talk about what they had no control over. And I knew somehow I need to be present with them and provide hope and encouragement along the way. I heard it said once, someone told me, you know, to be a good chaplain, you're gonna know you're being a good chaplain because the incarcerated people are gonna complain you're spending too much time with staff. And the staff are gonna complain you're spending too much time with the incarcerated people. And I find that to be very true. And somehow, I need to walk that line being a chaplain to everybody. There's also a saying of a Jesuit priest who worked for Congress as a chaplain. And he once said, no one wants a chaplain until they need a chaplain. And when they need a chaplain, you better be ready to respond. A few years ago, Christmas time, during COVID, my children and I, we went in the car and drove to my parents. We met with them for about a half hour out in their garage, standing about 15 feet away from them. I didn't want to be the one responsible for getting them sick. We stayed for about a half hour, drove home, and to try to make this Christmas day special for my kids, a different day than we normally have for the holiday, I spent more money than I ever could for a prime rib dinner. I cooked it, I made everything perfect, I must say so myself. I set the dining room table instead of the kitchen table where we normally eat. I even used cloth napkins instead of paper. Lit some candles, put on some Christmas songs, brought the food out, and called to my kids, it's time to eat. And just when we're about ready to sit down, my phone rang. And on the other side of the phone was the facility. There was a death of a person in the medical unit who was on hospice that was mentioned before, and I needed to come in. So of course, that's what I did. Got here, made the necessary, we made the necessary phone calls to the loved ones, started the process for the arrangements for the burial, and I spent some time with the hospice worker, an incarcerated individual, who was with the person during their last breath, giving them an opportunity to have a conversation and process what it is they just experienced. I wasn't mad, I wasn't upset, because it reminded me of something that we all need to be reminded of, something we're talking about here, that shared humanity. And we share that most readily in the time of our sorrows, griefs, and pains, as well as our joys. Thank you.